um, you should see my terminal output now, right? Just to uh, show you a glimpse of what's coming. This is the Exodata snapper, right? So, and, and the output is not that much different from the version what I showed a year ago, but now you can um, uh, access it more conveniently. So it's just one command you need to run. But I'm not going to go there yet. I'm going to show you the couple of slides first. Um, and uh, let's get started. Okay, so uh, you should see, hopefully you do see my screen, uh, a slide. Let's see what's going on here. If you don't see a slide right now, then just let me know. Okay, so uh, uh, these slides are what I uploaded to the website as well. So uh, in the blog entry, so you, you hopefully have gone through this. So. But I'll just show you a few things from here. Well, you know all this probably, if you read my blog. I am with Enkitech and, and this demo is done on, on one of the Enkitech's exodatas. So we actually have two. One is for playing and the other one is for work, like POCs. Okay, so uh, uh, one thing uh, is uh, what I'm going to show you, you here. I'm going to focus mo mainly on the smart scan, right? So I'm going to talk about the flash cache and how to measure that a bit as well, but it's mainly uh, about smart scans and how you uh, look inside these. Right, so and I will look, often refer to the OLTP workload versus the data warehouse workload. So, but when I, whenever I say OLTP workload, I mean a lot of small, quick SQL statements are executed very frequently. You know, sometimes you have similar workloads in data warehouses as well. You have some sort of single row inserts for some weird reason, or or you have some metadata updates or something like that, which are done maybe. Now, you know, one row at a time or a few rows at a time. You know, is it efficient or not is another story. But sometimes you do have this OLTP style workloads in uh, data warehouses. And vice versa as well, sometimes, well not sometimes, usually you do have reports in OLTP systems as well. You know, take eBusiness Suite or something like that. It's like an OLTP system, but, you know, you have 5,000 users connecting to it, running their forms but you also have 100 users who run reports, right? So, uh, so uh, whether smart scan is right for you or not um, depends on the workload, mainly how frequently you're gonna run this query. Is it many times per second, then, then it's an OLTP query and you should use indexes and caching. But if you run something once per hour or once every five minutes and it has to process all of your data, you get this whatever results, then this is smart scans. This is when you need smart scans. All right. Um, so um, um, I will skip this. I want to go to the Exodata snapper right away. Um, or almost right away. Um, so, uh, and, and the, in the one more comment about the previous slide that I showed is that uh, if your workload needs smart scans and is actually using smart scans, then you want uh, really multi-block reads. You want to read as many blocks as possible at the time. You don't want to do a smart scan reading eight kilobytes at a time. You want to read, you know, one megabyte at a time, or actually prefetch more and more so the same disk, so eight that one disk could actually service multiple IOs within one seek. Right. So that's another topic. Um, but uh, one more thing about the uh, Exodata architecture is, is uh, uh, that, um, uh, you know, if, if you wonder that how does, how does Oracle know in which cell my data is, you know, when I read a block from one cell um, or when I read a block from a table, how does Oracle know where into which cell to go? And the answer is, is here. It's, it's actually ASM who knows which cell to go to. And I'm going to show you a, a small demo, which is not about Exodata Snapper, but just so. Uh, so this is a uh, this is the Exodata V2, 
and we have I think we have three cells oops we have two cells here one cell has must have crashed or something uh, so as I said one exadata is for playing around and, uh, and another one is is for 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 work so apparently one cell is somewhere gone well I, I don't care about that right now so that's what I I don't want to demo that uh, so anyway but we have these groups and let's say if, if I have ASMLS right when I list a disk group from VDollar ASM disk, right? Normally, the disks, re, you know, reside somewhere like there is dev, uh, whatever, raw disk, and you know, like uh, or on Linux, the, the the easiest is like you have SDA one, SDD one, and things uh, devices like that, disk devices, right? But on Exadata. They, uh, you don't use this kind of OS devices, you're actually using Exadata specific devices. And they show up, show up here. So the path. So uh, normally it's something like dev SDA or dev SDB, but on Exadata it actually starts with O, whatever that means. Uh, and this is the IP address of the cell. So I can ping this IP and or SSH to that IP and I will end up in that cell. So uh, whenever ASM know, sees this, it knows that it's exadata and when it wants an allocation unit, you know, it wants to read a block um, in this uh, you know, from this disk, um, uh, uh, you know, then it knows it has to go to this IP address. It will send its request to the cell with this IP address and it will request hey, whatever, I want you to read this disk with this name and the cell figures out where exactly the, uh, you know, the, the blocks of this disk are, right? So ASM is really a, a key um, for, uh, for Exadata. So, you know, and also ASM does mirroring on Exadata as well and all, all, all this mirroring is actually an important uh, topic when we calculate IO, we'll, we'll get there. And one more thing here is, uh, well, uh, I could say that, well, at least when doing usual query processing, then one cell never talks to another cell. So, uh, so I try to illustrate this, that if these four boxes up here are the database nodes, the compute nodes, and this is, uh, these are the seven storage cells in the, um, in the half rack then these red lines are supposed to illustrate here that one cell never goes and talks to another cell. And why is it important? Uh, well, I mean, what, why, why is it done so? Well, basically, this is like an MPP grid here. So, uh, um, I mean, if you want to scale out Exodata to eight racks or four racks or something like that, you will end up with tens of cells, you know, close to 100 cells perhaps. Uh, and if all of these cells somehow chat to each other and take locks and you know block this and that, then you know, it it will end up with an unscalable mess, right? So so this that's why the cells never talk to other cells. It's the database layer who can talk to each cell, uh, but one cell doesn't talk to the other one. And why is it important? Well, what about if we have a chained row, right? If you have a chained row, it means that Half of the row is in one block and another half uh, is in another block. Or maybe it's three pieces in three different blocks, right? So maybe the first half of the row is in the cell number two, but when that second half is in a different block, this different block may reside in a different cell, right? So, so what, what should happen if, if, if a smart scan reads, uh, you know, which happens in a cell and it reads a block and it finds a chained row from there? Well, this cell number two cannot go into cell number five and somehow ask for, hey, give me the rest of the row and I'm going to put it together and send it back. It doesn't do that. Well, this is one situation where this cell number two would not process this particular block via the smart scan and it would actually send this block back to the database node with a special flag saying that hey we had a problem please process this block uh, as usual as you would normally do and it would be this database node 
who then will do a single block read into cell number five to get the second row piece and you know get it back and then put this row together and return it back to the user or application. So why am I talking about this? Well, if you do a smart scan and you don't hit these rows, you don't have such rows, well, it's gonna be really fast. But maybe uh, time times, or you know, maybe your application changes and three months later, you will have chained rows in this table and suddenly your smart scan is much slower, right? And, and my session, my Exodata Snapper and this talk is really mainly about how to measure what's happening when you run this smart scan, especially when these special conditions and problems happen inside the storage cell, right? So, uh, so this is what I'm gonna uh, show you. And, and this chained row problem, this is only one of these possible issues which may happen. By the way, I just realized I forgot to say something in the beginning. I mean, uh, I mean, what I've said over the last few years is, is Exodata works well in, if done right, right? So, so actually it is possible to achieve, you know, 20 times performance improvement if, you, if your su previous system was crappy enough and if you do Exodata right. So, so uh, but, I'm, but today I'm going to talk about troubleshooting, you know, because sometimes you do hit this problem and you have to fix it, right? To achieve this 20 times or 10 times improvement, right? So even though I'm talking about all the negative things which may happen in the storage cells, it's from e for educational purposes. I'm not here to tell you Exodata sucks. I actually happen to love it because it does work very well if you do it right, right? If you use it in the right place as well. Um, okay, so. So here is one more illustration of uh, um, what happens when you do a smart scan. It's, uh, it's basically the ASM mirrors all of your allocation units to this, um, or not mirrors, it stripes them as well, right? It stripes them to different storage cells. And on Exodata, by default, the allocation unit size is four megabytes. Um, but if you have a very big database, you might even wanna make it bigger. Uh, you would have less SGA overhead for the ASM extend pointer cache and, and, and so on. But um, oh, I will go back to the previous slide here. Uh, or actually, let, let, let me be here because it's not about the slides. I want to go to the demos. So um, one thing, uh, um, why the smart scans can be so fast, it is because you, will, you don't have one storage cell only. I mean, you have seven storage cells in this configuration. And when you start your smart scan, then in the, in the beginning of the smart scan against the segment, right? Uh, if the smart scan kicks in, then your database session or, your, or process, you know, it sends a message to each cell. It actually tells each cell, start working. Because thanks to the ASM, we know where our tables are striped to, right? So if I know that, hey, the first four gigabytes of this segment, these are striped across, you know, all the seven storage cells or all the seven disks uh, in ASM. So, so uh, uh, from the extent pointer cache, we will, in the, in the SGA, we, we know exactly where in ASM, you know, in which storage cells, in which um, logical locations uh, these uh, blocks reside. So when the smart scan starts, I can actually go through, I can send the message to all seven storage cells saying these kind of things. Okay, I'm gonna run the query uh, against uh, this table. I need uh, column one, five, and seven. By the way, there is a where, where condition on column number nine. And this where condition says where salary is bigger than 500 or something like that. And it also sends into all, all cells, it sends the extent maps. It basically tells that, hey, you scan these ranges of blocks because I know that my table is there. You scan these ranges. You scan these ranges and so on. And it sends a bit more metadata like the SQL ID as well for you know, diagnostics purposes and also the current system change number. I will explain why that's important. 
you know, because the, the read consistency must, must still work even on Exadata, right? So Exadata doesn't change that, but you know, it's, it's much more trickier because the cell cells are separate computers and they don't have access to undo, right? So I'll, I'll go through all of that by example soon. But, but basically what I wanted to show you here is that when the smart scan starts, then uh, it's not sequential. It's not like I go to cell number one and read a block and wait and go and go to cell number two and read the block and wait and so on. It's not like that. It's actually heavily parallelized and, and prefetching is happening everywhere. So when I start the smart scan, I will go through all the cells where my data is and I tell all the cells start working. And each cell starts working for me independently. So each cell will you know, read the data blocks from disk. It will already decompress the blocks, but whatever is needed. It will do filtering. It will take these columns what are needed. And each cell tries to have a megabyte ready or some amount of data ready for you in this memory buffer. So basically, once you have sent the command to, to get started to all the cells, then you go back to the first cell, cell and ask, okay, give me some data. Whatever you have, give me some data. And then you go to the second cell and say, whatever you have, give me some data. So the cells independently work for you, prefetch, preprocess, and always try to produce you a buffer full of rows, you know, which have been pre-filtered and decompressed and, uh, and, um, and where, you know, only these columns which you actually need are, are, are kept, kept there. So I'm going to go one slide back. So hopefully this explains why sometimes the smart scan wait events are only like 26 microseconds and so on. I mean, how, come we, how can we read four megabytes of data or whatever and filter and decompress it and send it over the InfiniBand to the database only in 26 microseconds, right? Well, and the answer is this wait event doesn't mean that we actually wait for the I.O. as well, the, uh, the, the disk I.O. The storage cells do work for us in advance, right? They always try to have a buffer full of data ready for you. And all I need to do then, all my session needs to do is go through each cell and say, okay, give me a buffer full of data, which you already have pre-processed and so on. So it's heavy pre-fetching. And also, you see, I mean, I'm illustrating a serial scan here, you know. I have a regular serial single session, right? Which goes through all seven cells and asks them to work for me. So even though I have a single serial session, I actually do have seven cells working for me. So I, I would say that this is like storage level parallelism. So, you know, the offloading and that all is great and the pre-filtering and everything, that's awesome, right? Um, but you know, we are not talking about one little computer here. We, we are talking about seven storage cells. All of them have their own CPUs. All of them have their own memory and, you know, their own flash and so on. So even if I run the serial query, I do have storage level parallelism. A lot of decompression, pre-filtering and so on can be done there. And, you know, when you scan through a fact table with 10 billion rows, it matters that you will have these additional computing power in the storage cells who, all, who, do, who do some of the pre-filtering. Pre-filtering is uh, cheap when you do it on one row, but when you do it on a billion rows, you know, even a simple wear condition is going to be pretty expensive. And if you haven't noticed, the storage layer has more CPU cores than the database layer. So that should say something about uh, the storage cells. Okay, I, I think that's it. Uh, I think it's time to start with demos. I've been blabbering around this slide so, uh, long enough. Um, but the key is, if you want smart scan, you know, if you want the most, to get the most out of the smart scan, well, obviously it has to kick in first, but also you want to make sure that you get this parallelism, that you will do multi-block reads, that you read a megabyte at a time and do, the, do all of the prefetching, and you won't, you, you do not get throttled by these, you know, possible hiccups like, like the single block reads uh, because of chained rows or single block reads because of consistent reads and stuff like that. And this is 
but I'm going to show you now how you measure that. So these all the scripts for what you see here, these are all downloadable, downloadable from my uh, from my blog. Uh, so uh, so I, I just listed a bunch of tables what we have here and uh, I have some some demo table from some benchmark I guess uh, called sales what I what I use here and there. And I'm going to do some very simple examples first, and if you have time, then we'll look into more complex things uh, as as well. Uh, okay. So, um, so uh, I do have a, let's see what version we're on. I think this is pretty much the latest version you can have. And, uh, and uh, um, I think it's patched to the latest um, Exadata as well with all the flash write cache and stuff like that. And I have this small script called my my stats. Which just displays my own session statistics. Alright. So uh, and this parameter, I looked into all the cell stat statistics. You see, when I searched for all the metrics in V dollar says stat, we have 49 different metrics which start with cell or you know have cell in them okay so uh, uh, so uh, uh, most of these stats I mean these these all of these stats are still cell related but what's really important which makes all of this possible what I'm showing to you is that many of these stats are communicated from the cell back to my database session so for example, cell flash cache read hits, right? So this is how many IO operations we managed to be read from flash instead of disk, right? So this is how many IOs we did read from flash instead of disk. I don't remember whether it was in blocks or in IO operations, but when we get to the snapper, I'll, I'll show you. Um, I have forgotten that already. But, you know, how, I mean, how come, I mean, how can, I know how many flash hits we had. I mean, because the database, my session is running in the database server, in the compute node, right? And all I'm doing, when I do IO for a smart scan or just regular buffered IO, I'm not directly accessing the disks in the cell. I mean, there's no way I can somehow directly access the disks which are actually connected in, into another computer. You know, the cell is a separate computer, right? So I cannot uh, directly read the disks. You know, how the I.O. really works is that I'm just sending a me uh, message over the InfiniBand network to the cell and in the cell we have a, a C++ program, program called cell server which just listens in a port. And I'm going to send a message to this C++ program and saying that, hey, read me block number X from, you know, the cell disk this or something like that, right? And it's the storage cell, you know, it's the cell server program in the storage cell which does this I.O. for me and it sends the resulting block back to um, uh, the database node, you know, when it's a regular I.O., right? But the still cell storage server, you know, might actually realize that, hey, this block is in flash cache. So I'm not going to go to the disk at all, I'm going to read it from the flash cache. And when it does so, it also sends me this information black back as well. That, hey, I read that many blocks from flash, flash cache. Or, as I'm going to show you soon, you know, when, uh, when, you, when you do have this chained rows problem, right? Then the cells, storage cells send you back metrics as well, that saying that, hey, we skipped, I mean, we had to... Mm, fall back to the regular block IO mode for this particular block or for, for that many blocks because they had a chain row in them. And there is more. You know, this is very interesting what I'm going to show you. It kind of shows you the cell processing depth that how, how deeply or how, how fully your, for your smart scan is, is, was actually executed in the cell. But the key is that all of that, let's say, um, I don't know whether most, but, but many of these metrics 
they actually happen inside the storage cell and they are then uh, communicated back to the database uh, session. So I could query it from v$sestat or v$mystat. So storage cells are not black boxes uh, for a database session, thanks to that. So uh, uh, as I said in the intro or in the announcement of this session that uh, getting this, you know, getting some insight about what happens in a cell is, is easy. And by that, I mean that I actually can query it from v$ sestat and so on. So I don't have to immediately go into cell server and run cell CLI uh, or list active requests or anything like that. I can actually start from, from the basics. Uh, and and, uh, and that, let, let, let's go on uh, to that. Um, so I'm, you know, and one more thing is that um, when I saw, when I realized that these metrics are sent to the database um, from the cell, I realized that, hey, this is really awesome instrumentation. And I was kind of smiling and I, I kind of saw, I, I kind of saw that this is, a, this is the experience in Oracle, right? So like 30 years, this, the engineers in Oracle have 30 plus years of pain troubleshooting problems, right? So now when they built the Exadata storage server software, they instrumented it properly, you know, and thoughtfully from start. You know, they didn't add some, you know, undocumented weird tracing events later on. I'm sure there is this kind of stuff there as well for unexpected issues. But I think they have done the instrumentation thing right from the start. Okay. So this particular session, what you see here, it hasn't done that much of work. Um, you see, there is a metric called cell physical IO interconnect bytes. So this is not related to a smart scan only or anything like that. This is all uh, traffic that this session has done with the storage cell. Okay, so uh, uh, possibly even, uh, I haven't checked that. I could uh, check some sort of uh, perhaps uh, uh, some, uh, you know, LMD processes and so on and see, uh, actually we can, we can check it. Uh, let's see, because uh, perhaps when a, when, a, when a rack lock manager process communicates with another rack node, you know, it, not, not with the storage cell, then, um, uh, then uh, uh, that metric should be incre incremented as well because the traffic is going through the InfiniBand. So if I look into some LMD process and I don't want to run Snapper right now, I just want to see what uh, you know, since that uh, since that process started, uh, the seed is this. Uh, what are what are the cell metrics for that seed? You know, since it started. Hmm. Actually, very interesting. So, uh, uh, I I expected this to be also non-zero, but let's look into some other process. So, so let's take an LMS process. Okay, very interesting. So I, I assumed, I had never checked it for some reason, that I assumed that uh, um, uh, you know, other traffic which goes through the interconnect, uh, like, uh, like, like two rec, background demons talking to each other would increment this as well, but apparently not. So, so it looks like this is all, this metric is fully about, um, uh, you know, traffic between cells, you know, uh, uh, sorry, traffic between your database session and the storage cells. Anyway, so this, um, uh, this metric tells you the all traffic, not just smart scan traffic, all traffic, you know, all the overhead reads and writes and everything. Okay. So, and I think now it's time to run uh, uh, run uh, some demos. So I, I kind of immediately jumped to this uh, v$sestat metrics because, uh, you know, this is like the step number two or three. Uh, I mean, the first steps when you troubleshoot why something is slow are, are still the same on Exadata. In other words, when your query is slow, check, you know, where does it wait the most? You know, is the execution plan correct? You know, how many IOs it's doing and so on. 
right? So on Exadata, Exadata doesn't change your troubleshooting starting point. But with Exadata, you can sort of go a bit beyond um, with Vitor or Sestact and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna basically what it means in data warehouse and when we talk about long running queries, it, it means SQL monitoring report should be the starting point because SQL monitoring report will uh, show you the wait events, it shows you the execution plan and also you know where inside the execution plan we spend the time. And it also shows a little bit of, uh, um, of uh, Exodata metrics as well, but I don't think it's shown in a very good way. Okay, so. I, was, I had a benchmark session going on here. Okay, so before we go into the uh, details of Exodata Snapper, uh, let's just run some query and let's see what happens. Let's actually use some column value as well. So let's say select sum. Right, so I have no idea, I haven't changed any parameters. I have no idea whether the smart scan will actually kick in. I don't even know what execution plan um, would be picked. However, in this case, I know that this table doesn't have any indexes or anything like that. So I just have simplified it for this demo. All right, uh, so, uh, so it's running. Well, it, it took about seven, seven seconds to run, right? So uh, I'm actually going to run it with the monitoring enabled, right? So, so with monitor hint, it enables the monitoring from start, not five seconds after it's been waiting for IO and, and running on CPU. So I just ran it uh, with SQL monitoring enabled. All right, still seven and a half seconds. All right, so let's see what this uh, query did. So I have this little script called XPA, which uh, queries, as you will see, it, it runs report SQL monitor. It queries that function pretty much and spools its output into a text file, or sorry, actually into an HTML file. And then it opens up this, uh, this uh, file once it's spooled. It's a bit slow because I'm, I'm in Europe and the servers are in, in Dallas and uh, you know, there is some latency. Oops, so my browser was in a different screen. So, okay, so I'll take a sip of water. So, uh, let, let's see what happens. So, uh, before, I mean, uh, this is a, like a quick intro into how you read a, a SQL monitoring report. Uh, I mean, usually I, I look into this time and weight statistics. So, the duration is uh, in uh, sort of human wall clock time, it's the time between the, when the execution started all the way to when the cursor gets closed. So if you open a cursor and run a query, you know, run a query which finishes in a second, and then you keep the cursor open for five hours, then you would see a duration of five hours here. So the duration really, you know, uh, if you, mm, or, or, you know, sometimes it's, you run a simple query which doesn't take that much of resource but you will you you your server is in new york and uh, your client is in hong kong or something like that it takes a long time to fetch the data but the database is not that active right the duration still shows you the human wall clock time that you know from the beginning of the execution all the way to when the cursor got closed right so but the database time now is uh, how much time we actually spent actively working in the database, you know, either on CPU or waiting for IO or waiting for some lock or whatever, right? And the database time uh, can be less than the duration because, uh, you know, again, maybe 
a lot of this duration is ha happens because of network latency or you know somebody keeps the cursor open. But the, data, the database time can also be bigger than the duration uh, if you run a parallel query. Because when you run with a parallel query with, with uh, eight slaves, then you will have eight slaves and ninth will be the query coordinator and they all can do work at the same time, right? So the database time may be, you know, nine times bigger than your duration then. So, and uh, basically, uh, then really the, the most important step, first step is, is this. Uh, you will move your mouse over here, the database time, and it tells you where most of this database time was spent. So basically, in, our, in my case, it shows that 95% of time was spent on CPU. So most of the time is spent on CPU, therefore that's what I want to look into. Therefore, I have to look into this column. Because this column breaks down where this CPU time then was spent, on which execution plan line, right? If it was opposite, you know, if, I, if, if most of the time was spent on user I.O. instead, then I would have to move, you, move into this wait activity and just look into in which, on which line most of this waiting happens, right? So SQL monitoring report on 11G can show that. It actually can drill down into the execution plan line level. And this data actually comes from ASH. So in ASH, you have new columns called plan line ID and so on. Okay, so anyway, in my case, it looks like there was no uh, bad I.O. bottleneck, you know, we didn't wait for I.O. much. So what happens when you don't have any bottlenecks? Well, you're going to be burning CPU as fast as you can and until the work is done. So, so this looks good, right? And uh, so, the, so the exadata specific, so what I showed you so far, it's, it's not exadata specific, right? It was, it, it's, it's the usual SQL monitoring. But this number now here is exadata specific. It's, uh, it's the cell offload efficiency. So on the slides, I said that I think this, this number is a, a bad way to put it uh, because it's actually not using correct metrics uh, as the basis. I'm going to show you that later. And, um, and also, it's something which is uh, for the whole query. It's like a query level thing. But usually, normal data warehouse queries consist of, you know, 10, 20 table joins or more, right? So uh, I would want to see uh, at the individual table level how efficient the offloading was. I'm going to explain what it is in, in a second. Okay, so that's why uh, it's actually really good that somewhere in Oracle 11.2, um, the SQL monitoring report start, started showing this at the table level or at the, at the row source level. So, uh, and what the, when you move your mouse over here, you will see in the explanation. I tried to make it bigger, so I, I, ho I hope you see it. So the 71% means that uh, uh, we, we had to read two gigabytes worth of data from the disk. You know, in order to scan through this table, we had to read two gigabytes worth of data. You see, I can, I can right click here on the IO requests and it shows that the table size or the segment size really is two gigabytes, right? Um, and uh, I had to read, uh, the, the storage cells had to read two, two gigabytes from the disk, but the storage cells returned only 648 megabytes back, okay? So it's much better to actually see actual numbers, not just a percentage, which doesn't really tell you, did we deal with a five megabyte table or five gigabyte table or something like that? Well, I can look into this column, of course, but, but I think it's much better to understand it, look into things that way, right? So, uh, uh, so, um, um, so, so the offload efficiency, 71% means really, when you look into these numbers now, it means that we avoided sending 71% worth of data back um, to, the, to the database. We had to scan through two gigabytes worth of blocks and we only, after filtering and after, you know, column projection, you know, taking only these columns we want, after that we sent back only 600 megabytes. 
Therefore, we did not have to send back 71% of the total si uh, table size worth of data. But now you might actually ask that, hey, what if this data is compressed? You know, what if I de decompress these two gigabytes and it will actually be 20 gigabytes worth of data? What happens then? So, well, then weird things will start happening. And again, that's what, why I wrote this uh, script. So let me actually go, uh, go there. So, I have plenty of copies here. So uh, these, are, um, these are the same table, the same amount of rows, uh, and some of them are just compressed, right? Okay, so, uh, um, so uh, uh, this is compressed with query high, I think, unless I've played around with it. And also, you might actually wonder what's going on here. That why is the number of blocks so big here? So, well, the problem is that when I compress the table, uh, again, and by the way, so, uh, yeah, so, so the problem is that when I compress the table, it goes much smaller. And if it goes much smaller, then, uh, uh, then uh, um, when you actually start scanning it, then, uh, then uh, Oracle, you know, this row source may actually decide that, hey, it's so small table, I'm going to read it via buffer cache. So, and if you read something via buffered cache, you won't have you won't ha have smart scans, and if you don't have smart scans for that particular table or partition, well, you know, all the blocks have to be read into the buffer cache. All of them have to be decompressed, possibly, if you actually you know you know select all the rows, uh, and so on. And this decompression happens in the database node. Then, you know, only if you actually have a smart scan, then you can offload stuff. If you don't have a smart scan, you cannot offload your decompression. So that's why, as a hack here, you know, I'm not saying that this is the best way to use in your production. You know, there are actually better ways. But as a hack, I, I set this number of blocks very high. By the way, this behavior showed up in Oracle 10, uh, sorry, not 10, 11.202. Oracle did not look into the optimizer stats when scanning uh, segments like that uh, in 11.201. It actually looked into the segment header and got the real number of blocks. But in 11.202 onwards, In, uh, in 11.202, 11.202, yes, <laughs> onwards, uh, Oracle actually started getting this, uh, basing this decision on, uh, uh, on optimizer statistics. If you search for that in my blog, you, I, I wrote the whole article. So it's actually not the CBO decision. It's, uh, uh, it's just that, the, you know, during every execution for every single segment, we will decide whether to use, to use a direct path read plus a smart scan or not. But instead of going to the segment header to get the number of blocks, we will actually go and get it from dictionary cache from the optimizer number of blocks. So this is why I changed that. So I wouldn't have to set undocumented parameters so that the uh, smart scan would kick in. Anyway, so long, long story. Right, so let's see what happens now. I monitor it from right from start, thanks to the hint. Right, uh, ran a bit faster, and let's see what. Let's see the results. So I right-clicked here to, to get IO bytes. So this table, you know, it used to be two gigabytes when it was uh, uncompressed, right? So now it is uh, uh, 100 megs only. I mean, smart scan would not likely have, the, have kicked in for so small table. Um, well, it depends on your buffer cache size as well. And cell offload of efficiency, well, let's see. <laughs> you see, it, it got better. I wonder if I have a different data there. Uh, well, if I go to the previous output, 59 million rows were sent back from the table uh, storage full to the counting. Here it's the same amount of rows, uh, but
Uh -huh. I think there is even something else going on, but I'll get back to that. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, the offload efficiency went better. So we read 124 megs from disk and we only sent 8 megs back. So now the question is that uh, why, uh, why, uh, why is it only 8 megs, even though it should be the same amount of rows, right? So uh, it actually is somewhat related to the segment size as well. But let's, uh, I'm, I still want to, I want to improve this. Or by improving, I mean, I want to actually, I want to make it worse. So uh, I'm going to use other columns here as well. You see what I'm doing here now? I just query more columns now. It's sort of the same query in the sense that it's the same table. It's the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, where clause. I, I query exactly the same amount of rows. However, however, I ask for more columns, right? So Oracle is smart and sort of uh, uh, proactively lazy in that sense that it doesn't do extra work when it's when it's not needed usually so uh, uh, it unless I actually go and touch you know read this column um, or want to write to it or whatever then it doesn't uh, send it from the storage cell and you see you see how long it runs you know it previously it ran for six seconds but now what's going on I mean why is the same query you know it's, it's still like it's a 100 megabyte uh, Table, so why is it so slow? Let me just quickly see, make sure it's not stuck somewhere. Yeah, it's on CPU. So, uh, well, we can see what is it doing. I can run the uh, SQL profile uh, again. What I'm trying to actually show you here is that uh, uh, the, I think now it's completed. You see, it took more than a minute. All right. So I ran the SQL profile, um, not SQL profile, sorry, <laughs> SQL monitor. Uh, so uh, it was still executing, but you know it already had been running for one hour, uh, for one minute. Okay, and what I wanted to show you actually has happened. The cell offload efficiency has gone to minus one hundred fifty-six. You see, here it is as well. It's the negative cell offload efficiency. I mean, what the hell is going on here? And when, I, when we actually wrote the, the book, uh, the expert Oracle Exodata book, then I started looking into where does the SQL monitoring report take these metrics. And I started studying and testing these metrics, and I found out that they actually take it from the wrong place. Uh, so, uh, so and, and that's why I wrote this Exodata snapper. So that's one problem. This is one of the main drivers why I, I, I wanted to write this tool. And you see the offload efficiency went negative because uh, we read only 100 megs from disk, but we sent 200 megs worth of data back. Because when we decompressed the blocks we wanted, uh, we sent more data. And my previous query you know, had a positive offload efficiency because I only took one column. You know, and, uh, so, so I didn't have to take all of the columns. I only took a, a small slice of the table. But now when I selected all the columns, actually, actually I did something with these columns, then, uh, then uh, all of them had to be decompressed and sent back. So therefore we actually sent back more data in bytes as there was in compressed form in blocks in disk. Right? So this is one reason why offload efficiency goes negative. And if you wonder why, this, why is it so slow, because you know, I mean, it, it ran for six seconds and then now it ran for a minute. I mean, sending 280 megabytes over the network, you know, on InfiniBand shouldn't take a minute, right? So what's going on here? Well, we don't have to guess. You see, 
the, the green bar here says that 99% over a minute of time was actually sent, uh, spent on the CPU. Not network, not cells or, or anything like that. On the CPU in the database server. Well, the CPUs were doing something. Move your mouse over here and you will see. Well, 91% of all the CPU time used by that query was spent in sort aggregate. Well, what's going on here? Well, think about it. We use a storage cell which sends 52 million rows back really fast. You know, it may actually be more because some could be filtered out here, but, but we have 51 million, 52 million rows uh, which are sent to this sort aggregate. And so, sort aggregate is the function or is the row source where all of these kind of um, aggregations are done, you know, sum and count, min and max, stuff like that. So when you, when you just sum together, when you sum together, uh, uh, you know, some column from 52 million rows, well, it took six seconds or whatever, like five seconds perhaps. But you see what we do here, we sum multiple columns. So each of these operations takes time, right? Well, uh, you see, this needs date arithmetic as well. You know, I could add some square root in here, it would be even slower, right? So, so uh, if you sum up 10 rows, I mean, it's, it's, it's fast, you don't even notice. But when you have a billion rows to deal with, or when you return 52, 52 million rows, then this stuff matters. But the cool thing is that without Exadata, you would have had this, this CPU time plus more, plus all the IO time. You know, this query would have run for 10 minutes, right? With Exadata, we already could offload the IO and decompression and some of this stuff to the storage cells and parallelize it there, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, you know, it, 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 you, you got to pay attention to these metrics, okay? So, however, another case is when the offload efficiency goes negative is when you actually do writes as well, because write also does I.O. But I'm going to show it to you with Exadata Snapper. Okay, so now it's time for first, you know, I've spent an hour for the introduction and now I take a, another sip of water and then we, I will introduce you, I will show you how the Exadata Snapper works and then I will run it on the same, ex, uh, same situation. I will run it uh, on the same query and let's see whether it is any better than, uh, than SQL Monitoring Report.